Our speaker today is Steve Cheney. He's a Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service agent and a horticultural expert. Today, he's gonna to talk to us about container gardening. All right, so Steve, I'm gonna go ahead and switch it over to you if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your presentation. All righty, well, thank you. Uh, okay, let's see, what can we do here? All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Can yep. everybody see it? All right, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about container gardening due to all of the things that are going on right now with the COVID and, and the stay at home. Uh, everybody's been uh, taking up gardening again, which is great. Uh, the only downside to it is that they're making my phones ring off the wall with questions about gardening, so. But that's good, I'm glad to hear that. Anyway, I, uh, my, as she said, my name is Steve Cheney. I'm the Extension Horticulturist. I've been with them quite some time. Uh, I enjoy gardening and it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm not the most IT person in the world, but we're learning. So uh, hopefully it'll go smooth. Anyway, that's uh, my little friend, uh, Container Gardening Pal, uh, made out of old clay pots. I always thought he was kind of fun. All right, why container gardening? You know, there's lots of ways and lots of reasons to do it, but the main one is a limited space. Or maybe you have an unsuitable area to grow things in, uh, you know, too much shade, too much sun, whatever it may be. Poor soil, uh, concrete, uh, you know, condo, zero lot line, whatever it may be. Uh, maybe you have limited time or resources and don't have the time to have a great big half acre garden and that's great too accessible gardening uh, i know as i get a little more mature um it's a little harder for me to get out there and garden so accessible gardening is is really important and it's flexible you can do all kinds of things with uh, container gardening space needed you might just do it on a windowsill inside with maybe some herbs that you're, you're cooking with uh, maybe just out on a patio if you're in an apartment or a condo. Uh, maybe on a balcony. Uh, maybe just out on your doorstep. The neat thing about containers on a doorstep is that you can have a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, next month you can rearrange them and put them on different sides and put them up on bricks and hang them and do various different things. Uh, the next month you can put them on the back porch and bring all the back porch out to the front porch. So there's really a lot of different leeway about that. Location requirements, for the most part, we need a lot of sun. Uh, for most of your bedding plants, you need a minimum of six hours of full sun. Vegetables, eight to 10 hours of full sun. Uh, that may be tough, you know, so you just kind of have to see what you can do. Uh, and most importantly, close to a water source. Nobody wants to drag tons of hoses or go back and forth in the house with a little bitty tiny watering can. Uh, so you want to make it easier for you. Containers come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Uh, it needs adequate drainage. Uh, never held toxic material, both to people and plants is very important. If you're any of you have been around a few days, you might re recognize that that's in one of those old Samsonite suitcases. I found that in a garage sale for a dollar a long time ago. Uh, bought it, drilled a few holes in the bottom, and it made a wonderful uh, basket or a wonderful container. The neat thing about it is when you're tired of it, you just close it up and, and pack it away and go on to the next place. Anyway, this idea there. Uh, containers also need room for roots and obviously mobile, right? Uh, you get that? That's the bad thing about doing it online. You can't see the people's reaction. You don't know if they're laughing or frowning or going, huh? So anyway, the bicycle was kind of a fun mobile thing, I thought. Uh, different kinds of containers. Uh, you know, people a lot of times will ask the differences between terracotta and concrete and all those things. So you know, most of what you see out there, you're gonna see some glazed ceramic. Uh, a lot of it's made in China and Vietnam, that area, it's high fired. It's durable and has a rainbow colors. And it's really pretty and really uh, attractive outside on your porches. Uh, the old fashioned kind is a terracotta, original burnt orange pot made from fire clay. It's very porous, 
excellent for drainage, but you got to be careful. And in, in outside, it can you get a heavy freeze, can crack. Concrete used around public buildings. It gives formal homes because of durability. Uh, some people have some old iron pots. It provides an old world look, a long life, but it's very heavy to try to pick up and move. And then lots of unusual containers. That's what I like to do with the bicycle and the, and the suitcase. And, and you'll see a few more when we get into this presentation. But make sure they have drainage and make, let your imagination run rampant. So here's, here's some imagination. Flower pots, ceramic pots, window boxes, gallon cans, drums, barrels, gutters, hanging baskets, baskets with plastic lining, buckets, trash cans, shoes, bathroom for, uh, fixtures. And be careful, it may not fit in your, home, your HOA though, so. Uh, here's an old car, you know, there was a junk car, and so they just decided that was a great container and you know filled it full of, of interesting plants anything works uh, as long as you can have some drainage and put some water in it uh the you know from year when i was a kid everybody used old whiskey barrels you know cut them in half and you can find them at every hardware store and all those kinds of things and they did wonderful eventually they rotted out but it was a great container Chimney flues are fun. Uh, used to see those all the time uh, when, you know, as people were building in uh, new houses and then they would get all these chimney flues and they'd cut them to fit and then they'd have all kinds of pieces left. You could go by and, you know, say, hey, can I have those, you know, from the builder and say, can I have those things before you throw them away? And they said, sure, you know. So you could paint them, you could stain them, you could stucco them. They were tall cylinders. Uh, most of them were kind of square. Some had holes in them. They were really fun. But now, after a while, people caught on to it and they knew people were using them. So then you go by and ask, and they say, Yeah, you can have them for $25, $30, $40, whatever it may be. So not quite as fun anymore. But to have an upright uh, container like that can really be an interesting idea. Hanging baskets, all kinds of hanging baskets. The more you can hang, the more fun you have. One of the neat things that a lot of people don't think about is you have very little insect issues on a hanging basket. And people say, well, well why? Well, if you hang it up, it's way up in the air. And so if the insects are on it, then they're very open to their predators of birds and other things like that, as opposed to being on the ground. So you'll find very few insects way up in the air like that. And you'll have a lot less disease because you get good airflow. Window boxes are fun. Uh, I love this picture. I've used it for years. And usually when we uh, are presenting live to people where you can see them, you know, you ask them, and, okay, do you think is, is that really a window box or what? Or is it something else? People say, well, look at you and they say, funny. Okay, what? Well, it is a window box on the side of a shed and an artist painted that window. So that's a painted, it's not even a real window. It's really, I thought it was fantastic. And then they just created a window box underneath it. You know, obviously real flowers too, by the way. Even regular old pots, you know, plastic ones or ceramic ones or whatever. You know, you, they can be fun because they can get all kinds of colors. You can change them out quickly, inexpensive, uh, and just have some fun. Ornamental grasses, uh, nothing like uh, fun ornamental grasses and a big toad like that. A big toad can really be a fun container to get some people's attention. Here's one, This I thought this was really neat. Uh, those are uh, iron uh, containers, the big tall white ones. Uh, and they, are, they painted them white because that way they really stood out in the shade and in the sun. They're tall, they give you all kinds of interesting looks. But in a minute, you'll see there's the same one, but in a dark color. And it's almost a silver. The reason they did that, because it's more in the shade and, and it's real close to the water, so it reflects the water. There's some of the more of the water there, some of the containers in the, in the water, which is a neat thing. Uh, or you can have them on the outside of the water. You can have wispy, you can have color, you can have all kinds of neat, fun things. 
This was the, you know, we talked earlier about concrete for commercial things. Uh, this is an interesting bed. This was at the uh, Ball Seed Company uh, in Chicago. And they had a big flat acre, several acres where they did a lot of presentations. And one day uh, Mrs. Ball came out and she said, you know, I'm tired of looking at flat areas. I want some interesting containers. So they brought all these in and built them and, and made huge berms and it just turned out gorgeous. There's some other more interesting pots uh, and we'll talk in a minute and you'll know a little bit more about it, but if you've ever heard the thriller, the filler and the spiller, here's the top coming out of the top. You can see the thriller. I hope you can see my cursor. And then you got the filler going in the side and then you got the spiller coming out. So just remember when you're doing a big pot, thriller, filler and spiller. There's some all kinds of more little interesting pots, you know, different sizes, different textures, different colors, uh, you know, and again, it doesn't all have to be flowering. It can be the texture of the leaf, such as some of those mustards and, and different things. They can actually be really pretty gorgeous. All right, this was in Iowa. I found this at Iowa State. I thought it was really interesting. They were during their recycling year. So they, they make containers out of recycled material and that was a, a part of a car, you know, with mufflers sticking up, you know, kind of interesting with some, you know, some hubcaps, not everybody. And again, check your HOA. And here's one where they took some trucks. Well, you know, they got a truck bed. It's an ideal container. Uh, and they took the engine out of it and filled the engine compartment up with, with stuff and it made it really neat. I loved it so much. I took several pictures of it, some close-ups, but you know, hey, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a, they have a smaller container there. All right, this was, I kind of thought was really neat. You know, a lot of times when you're, this was at a wedding and where the bride and groom came in and they, it was a really neat arch out there, but it was just kind of bare. You know, there was no color. It was all, you know, just kind of not too interesting. So they simply put out a couple of pots out there with some color and it draws your eye right to it. So sometimes that's the neat thing about color and the neat thing about containers. The vertical gardening. I don't know if any of you have ever thought about it or seen that. Uh, it's a real interesting way to grow on the side of a building or the side of a wall. That's simply uh, some two by sixes in the back and they nailed them together to make a frame and put some chicken wire in there, put a little bit of landscape fabric behind it to keep the um, soil from falling out and then they planted directly in it. Now they were behind it, there's an irrigation system that irrigates it, but you know, hey, it's a vertical garden, it's a wonderful container. Something unusual. Here's some interesting, there's some chimney flues, there's a raised bed, there's some broken pottery, there's some pottery that's laying on its side. You know, obviously it's at a retail establishment, but I thought it was some kind of an interesting way of looking at things. Get out in the country a little bit. This is, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar over by Tyler, Blue Moon Nursery. Uh, this was a place they had there and, and they had that little uh, figure setting up and then they had a bathtub back there. Uh, and, and, you know, so it's kind of interesting, you know, not everybody wants a bathtub or has a place for a bathtub or, but, you know, it's kind of different. There's another big frog. Uh, it's got some interesting plant material in that, uh, you know, and that can be a fun. That was furnished by Western Gardens, by the way, and that was at um, Mayfest a few years ago. And you know, I thought I always thought that was a wonderful container. Uh, and, you know, everybody that walked by during Mayfest had always caught their attention. On your porch, you know, again, you may want something, some interesting things that may be herbs. All of those things that are in that picture are all edible. May just want to accent pieces to again with the thriller and the spillers and the fillers, uh, something just to accent a wall or accent a walkway or something. 
Uh, this is a neat patio in, in Arizona. I thought it was kind of fun. So they use great big, huge plants, but they also had some hanging baskets and they had some things growing up and going up through the uh, arbor. They're around a outdoor fireplace, you know, some smaller things that are manicured, not a lot of color, but, uh, you know, some interesting containers. Uh, and, you know, and they had to throw the pet dog in there too, just to have some fun. This is in a small little courtyard. They wanted something, you know, it was tall, uh, bare walls. And so they put in some trees actually in uh, some large containers, had a little nice little seating area there. And so they made it a very exclusive little private garden, which that really is a fun way of doing it. And you can, the only way you can do it is with containers when it, you can't don't have anything plant in the ground. Here's some succulents. Everybody's doing succulents these days. There are so many of them out there and they're, they're just absolutely gorgeous. The biggest thing you got to remember is if you're planting succulents outside or if you're putting them in containers outside, you may have to bring them in during a heavy winter because they they will just melt in or if they get really heavily frozen. But, you know, they put, keep them in smaller containers are easy to bring in. And this is always the one where I get people to guess what that is. It's a container, uh, you know, and they just pruned it. But it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because it's wheat. You know, it's a, it's planted solid full of wheat. And so it's coming up and then they just pr pruned it off at various different levels to kind of give uh, some texture and to give a different look to it. I think it's kind of interesting. There's some more different ones with some flues and some other pots. Uh, there's some with uh, fennel so that you can actually harvest it and eat it. And then if you just absolutely want a really low maintenance pot that you don't have to do much with, then there's a little bitty water garden. It's just a pot that you fill full of water and put water pot, water plants in it. Uh, drop a mosquito dunk in there once a month. Keep adding a little bit of water to it and you've got an instant water feature, an instant water garden, all in a, in a simple small container. Anything goes, uh, you know, this is another one of my garage sale finds, uh, just an old pair of, uh, you know, galoshes. You know, they, you know, they were for, you know, for a buck. So you drill a couple holes in the bottom, fill it full of different plants. And, you know, you got some instant pots that are easily to move. Got to keep eye on them so they don't walk away though. Here's a, uh, a wicker bassinet. Another garage sale find that I thought was interesting. Uh, and they pulled all kinds of neat, fun, pl you know, plants in there. This is for a, a gentleman that uh, had needed some uh, help. Uh, you know, so he had a, needed an enabling garden to make it more accessible for him. So he wanted a combination of a water feature and, and some container garden. So they, he had this built. Uh, he can do it, you know, easy, and he's got a little bit of all of it there. So, you know, anything is possible, just your imagination is your only limit. Here's some more fun pots. Uh, herbs in containers, again, you know, you may just want uh, an herb garden, and you may not have any place to, pl to put it, so it may all be in containers, and that can be fun. Uh, here's a local garden, and they took out all of the grass. There's not a single blade of grass in there. And uh, obviously the age old container, which is a bonsai. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting plant. That's a hundred and gosh, at that time it was a 150 year old tree. So that was probably 25 years ago. So it's probably 175, 180 year old tree now that they put in a bonsai and kept it alive and kept it growing. Uh, and it's a wonderful hobby. It's a wonderful practice. Uh, and to some people, it becomes much, much more than that. Uh, you know, if you go out, this is out in San Angelo, and they loved agave. They had terrible soil, so they just decided to have an agave and cactus container garden. 
And that can be fun. So it, you're not limited to edibles or to pretty flowers or whatever your, again, imagination is your only limit. Uh, this is an, in a downtown area. Uh, any of you that might be able to guess, you know, we always try to have a little guessing game here to see if anybody can recognize it, but it's in downtown Chicago. And they had some these nice long beds along the main street there. Uh, oh, can't think of now the name of the street, but it's a big famous street. And nobody would pay any attention to them. They threw trash in them and they did all kinds of things. So then they changed them out and put water features in there. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's not really a container, but the whole entire bed is a raised container. So I just thought I'd throw it in there for fun. Here's, you know, uh, some different uh, looks of it. And people really stopped and, and appreciated it. And they, were, they quit throwing trash in ink, really started taking a lot of pictures of it. So containers can be a lot of different things. They can be porous, uh, clay or wood, uh, but they dry out a little bit faster. If it's a non-porous container, such as plastic or ceramic, they retain water a little easier. Uh, metal or dark pots retain heat, so they'll use up a little water a little quicker. Uh, and small pots versus large pots as far as what type of plants you can put in them. And there's another one of my garage sale finds, little children's glasses. But growing media is always important. You want as light a weight growing media as possible. You know, we call it growing media as opposed to a lot of the uh, nurseries and box stores that call it potting soil because in the majority of it, there actually is no soil in there. It is actually a growing media, man-made growing media that is lightweight, that drains well, uh, and doesn't help keep it, you know, causing any issues. Uh, but it will hold a little moisture, can, you know, needs to drain well, and it needs to be disease and weed free. Potting mixes are readily available. You can mix them out of peat moss, you can mix your own out of perlite, vermiculite, sawdust, wood, chop, wood chips, and just about anything else that you want to do. It just all depends on what you like. Uh, you know, some of those are maybe going to the perlite and the vermiculite may go away one of these days because of the dust that it creates and people need to wear a mask when working with that. So the EPA has been talking about that, but we'll see. Compost, garden soil is often too heavy, so you want to be careful that you don't uh, put garden soil in your pots. Plants, you can do annuals, you can do perennials, you can do shrubs, you can do vegetables, you can do fruit, you can do herbs. Again, the sky's your limit on what you do and what kind of extra yard art that you put in there and whatever you do to make it fun for you. Uh, the plants, you need to make sure the right plant at the right place, sun versus shade. Uh, you know, we we get a lot of sun in north central Texas, and so if it's going to be out in full sun, you need to make sure it's hardy enough or as it should be in the shade or partial shade or whatever it may be. The size. Obviously, if you got a little bitty tiny container, you don't want a great big tree. Vice versa, you don't want a little bitty tiny plant in a huge container. Match the light and the moisture requirements, uh, you know, what it, what it needs. Similar growth rate when you're putting the plants in, because you don't want one that you don't want a cactus in with a, you know, a vine that just grows overnight. Uh, use varieties if, uh, as far as vegetables for that are made for containers, such as the patio, pixie, tiny tim, all of the little small uh, tomatoes. Design principles are important to remember, and that's the focus, the balance, the form, the texture, uh, the rhythm, the proportion, and the color. Focus is what draws your eye first. Is it the yellow? Is it the black? Is it the white in there? What draws your eye first? You want to place it right below the tallest point. Uh, you know, and different people will think different things. Some people say it's the black that draws your eye first. Some people think it's the yellow that draws your eye first. But the tallest point is the white, but, and so that you're planting a little bit below that. You create uh, texture, color, form so that everything kind of fits together. 
balance is stability uh, and kind of goes along with that wheelbarrow you know they're not not quite as stable if you're not careful symmetrical or asymmetrical and the same visual weight form again the thriller the filler the spiller is the line the mass the filler the cascading part of it you know that just completes a pot you know lots of interesting things there and no matter what time of day or when you're looking at it it captures your attention uh, ideally, we would want to use three to five different textures, uh, depending on the size of the container. If you get too many more, it, you, it gets too busy and you start, you spend all your time going, oh, what's that? What's this? What's that? If you got three to five, you, you identify the, them real quickly and you, you can enjoy them. Uh, again, you want something that's a little bit coarse. You want something maybe a little bit medium and then something a little bit of fine texture. And rhythm is just repeating color, form, or texture uh, so that everything kind of fit, fits together. You don't want to have, you know, every single thing being different because then it just, you know, boom, 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 and, you know, and you're kind of, you get lost sometimes. Proportion is important to match your plant size to the container size. You know, uh, the plant's a little bit small for that container, but hey, it's a container and it works, so it all depends on what you want to do. Tips, mix plants with at least three textures. Uh, use plants with interesting foliage, varying your colors, your textures, uh, your shapes, your sizes. Use plants with interesting flower shapes that catch your eye. And some may need trimming, some may need a little bit of deadheading or some you may just have to reach in and uh, pull it out and replace that plant, but that's easy to do. Watering, check soil moisture. Uh, you can need it, you know, some people need a moisture meter to make it work because they're just not comfortable enough judging. Uh, but basically you want to go one inch below the surface of the, of the pot to see if there's any moisture there. So that's usually a lot of people, unless you got a real fancy manicure, or just use your finger, your index finger, and go down to the first joint. And you know, if you don't feel any moisture, then, then it's time to give it a drink. You want good drainage, so in case it rains or in case something happens, you don't, this is not sitting there in water. Because that, you know, overwatering, underwatering problems are the biggest issues that we have with uh, container plants. You know, and sometimes the symptoms are very similar to each other. Leach pot once a week, uh, you know, that may be a little often depending on the pot, but, and for those of you not familiar with leaching, that's where you simply take the pot out, put it on grass or something where the water can run into, and just run it till it's completely full, and until the water is just rushing out the bottom. And that leaches out any salts, it leaches out any contaminants that might be in there. And, but most important is when you bring that container in for the winter, uh, most of the insects that are out there lay their, uh, eh, lay their eggs in the soil to overwinter. And then, it, so if you bring a potty in in the wintertime and it comes in where it's moist and you've got some humidity and the temperature is controlled, then the eggs think, hey, it's time to hatch. So if you, if you leach it two or three times before you bring it in, uh, you'll drastically cut down the amount of insects you bring into the house. Uh, always mulch them and always, I always get a kick out of people that don't mulch. Uh, they mulch their flower beds, they mulch everything outside, but they don't mulch with containers. It's the same thing, same principle. And leave one to three inches at the top of a container if possible so that your water has a place to go in and it's not just running off right away. Fertilization is always important. A compost or slow release fertilizer is going to be the best. Uh, liquid fertilizer is easy to put too much on. Uh, if you put too much, then the plants grow real tall, real fast, real spindly, and then salts build up real quickly. If you don't do enough, then you got real slow uh, growth and your leaves often will start yellowing. Disease and insects, uh, insect prior to planting, 
uh, so that you know if you go to the hopefully you go to a good nursery and they they kept track of that so there's no insects on there but it's possible you could bring some insects home uh, so inspect them to make sure that they're healthy and, and disease and insect free manual removal is always good uh, unless you're real sheepish uh, and then water spray or soap are always going to be your first avenues of treatment uh, before you pull out the heavy chemicals. All right, this is just for the people that don't understand your style of gardening. I always thought that was kind of interesting. You know, not everybody has the same sense of humor as I did, though. All right, questions and comments. That's the end of this talk. I wanted to keep it short and to the point. Um, there's my number uh, and my email. Feel free to give me a call at any time. Uh, currently, due, like I said, due to the COVID, we're working remotely and not in the office at all times, but have the phones all uh, forwarded to me. So I will get your email, or I'll get your email and get your phone number, your phone as well. I may not get back to you at the moment, but that's what we have voicemail for. So hope that helped you to know a little bit about containers uh, and maybe answered a few questions and maybe stimulated your mind on what you can do with what you have and maybe uh, might even go find some new colorful ones or maybe a suitcase or a bicycle so thanks and we'll, i'm going to turn it back over to heather okay great thanks so much steve that was awesome um i think we have a lot of questions here so i'm going to just go ahead and start asking you some questions um the first question is uh, what's the best time to grow hot peppers in north texas uh, you know, they, you grow hot peppers two times a year. You plant them in the spring, so uh, usually in April, uh, and so they'll grow most of the summer, and then it gets too hot. They may get a little hot, you know, they'll burn up, and then you can go again in the fall and create a fall crop. Most times in north central Texas, the uh, fall crop is, is vegetables is going to be better than the spring crop. Okay, great. All right, let's see. Um, someone asked, how do you keep your hanging baskets from drying out so much? Um, you know, they really don't dry out that much more. Um, a lot of times, most people will hang a hanging basket kind of underneath a porch or an arbor, so it gets a little break from the sun, uh, but you just gotta check them a little more often. Uh, and, you know, because when you put them in, and water them, you know, if the if it's on the ground, then sometimes it'll help moderate the water use. If it's up in the air, then it'll leak out the bottom. So just have to check it just a little bit more often. Okay. And it seems like a lot of people are having problems with, especially, you know, here in Texas when it's so hot, um, their containers drying out fast. Do you just have any general tips on how to keep it maybe like the soil medium or um, just any tips on how to keep it wet? Uh, you know, there, there are lots of different ways. You know, one of the big ones is like we talked about is be sure you mulch them and that helps hold okay. a little bit of the moisture in. But there are a lot of really great uh, soil crystals uh, that you put it, you know, that you put into it, mix in with your potting soil that when the water hits it, it actually holds that water in there and kind of forms into like a little gel and then slowly releases the water back out. Uh, so I always suggest looking at that. Uh, some of the potting so uh, potting media has that already, but uh, if not, get your small container of that and add a little bit and follow directions, add it to the soil. Okay, and do you recommend um, having like a tray underneath and keeping like water in that tray? Trays are important, you know, because if you don't have them, you know, obviously in the house you need them because, you know, then it'll run out on your cabinets or your windowsills. Uh, but outside it's nice too because if you don't, it can stain your deck or it can stain your your concrete. Uh, it gives you a little bit of a, a place to hold a little additional water. Uh, some of the containers are even made with uh, reservoirs at the bottom. So instead of watering the soil, you actually fill up the water, the reservoir at the bottom and it pulls water up into the soil. So, you know, they're kind of different things depending on what you're looking at, but yeah, trays are important. Okay. 
And then someone's asking what is the best practice for, for deadheading your um, flowers and does it differ, differ by plant? Where do you cut? It does, but basically you're going to cut back to that first node right below the the flower, and that's where the where the branch is coming up from. You know, um, where the leaf comes out, and then they usually come right up above that and have a flower. Uh, so some usually, if you can, cut it back to that first node. Uh, that'll help stimulate new growth. Uh, if you can't, some people just you know print it right below the flower, uh, just to get that spent bud off of there. Okay. And what is your advice for what is your suggested um, growing media? I know that differs for plant for different plants, but um, what what do you like to use in your pots? I'm you know I make my own compost, so you know I uh, usually just find a, uh, a growing media. There's some a couple of commercial growing medias that we use in the greenhouse that I like. Uh, but, uh, you know, something that's got a little bit of, if I'm going to mix it, something that's got a little bit of vermiculite, a little bit of perlite, a little bit of compost, and then a little bit of, uh, you know, chopped up bark, uh, which I, you know, it gives, it opens up the pores a little bit and allows the air and the water to get down in there a little bit. Okay. And can you kind of walk us through the process of how you use soap to remove bugs from your container plants? Soap is, you know, like I said, the first thing you're always going to, if you have, if you have bugs on your plants, whether they be in containers or not, you know, the first thing is to go, go put a, a high pressure nozzle on your hose and turn it on and just kind of beat the plant with the water pressure and that'll knock some, most of them off. And people say, well, okay, it knocks them off. Aren't they going to come right back? Well, sure. But, you know, you're going to knock them off, and then you, they're going to come back, you knock them off, they come back, you knock them off, they come back. And they're kind of like anybody else, you know, after two or three times getting knocked off, they say, hey, I'm going next door. He doesn't even have a hose. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then you might want to use, uh, you know, a hosing sprayer that, had, that you put a couple drops of Dawn or something like that. And what happens is that soap so keep, creates a soapy residue. You spray it on there and it gets on the insects and the insects don't have any way to get that soapy residue off. And so on a lot of them, it just suffocates them. And so that's a, a quick, easy way because the soap's not gonna harm your plants, not gonna harm your soil, and then it's not gonna harm your, your pets or anybody else. It just takes care of a, a lot of the classes of insects. Okay, and when it comes to um, native plants or plants that are really super adapted to our hot weather, what are your favorites for containers? Oh goodness, there's so many of them there. Um, Now you put me kind of at a spot. <laughs> there, there, you know, there's a lot of them out there. You know, for the spiller, you know, there's frog fruit and, and several of the different uh, ground covers that work really well for that. Um, you know, there are a lot of really good uh, native salvias out there that are fun to, to, to garden with because they take so much. Uh, you can cut them back two or three times a year. Uh, you know, and so. You know, and there's some, uh, there's a few ornamental, native ornamental grasses that work. Depends on the size of the pot. So, you know, you can't go wrong with a native plant, uh, you know, because it's well, more well adapted to our droughts and our, our temperatures. So just whatever you like works probably good. Okay, great. And so, okay, someone is asking about, um, combating high wind. So if you if you live maybe in a high rise, you're on a balcony and your plants are getting beat up by wind, do you have any way to combat that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, sometimes depending on where it is, you know, if it's a wrought iron balcony, you know, that, uh, you know, you might consider putting uh, a small strip of shade cloth or a small strip, a strip of, uh, uh, freeze cloth or something along that that allows some of the all the sunlight to come through but it will hold that you know cut down a lot on the wind coming through 
if you're hanging them, there's not a whole lot you can do in that aspect. But if you've got them down on the floor, uh, you know, either a bigger pot in front of them to help protect it or something like a shade cloth or, a, excuse me, freeze cloth. Okay. Yeah, so basically try to try to place something that'll block the wind a little bit. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, someone has an issue with getting mold growing on some of their pots, particularly terracotta pots. Um, mm -hmm. Is that an issue with too much moisture or is there a way to combat that? Generally, you know, it would depend on where the mold's growing. If it's growing on the outside, uh, that's just a little bit too much moisture. Terracotta does obviously retain a lot of moisture and most of the time what you'll see is salt rings on it the white rings that go around on the outside edges uh, and all you can really do is just periodically empty the pot out uh, sterilize it really good and, and scrub it uh, with a good soapy water and some brushes and, and that'll usually get a lot of that off but if you've got mold or something growing on on the inside then obviously you're watering way way too much Okay. And can you talk a little bit about the mulching on the top? Um, is that mainly just like bark mulch or are you talking about maybe putting some like gravel in the top or? Oh. It's just, it really all depends on what you want. Uh, you know, the I, I prefer in a pot to use uh, a bark mulch simply for the fact it's lighter weight than putting rock. Um, it will slowly break down into the soil and give you a slow release fertilizer over a period of time and it tends overall to retain moisture a little better than the rock does uh, you know I, although I've, I've done some really neat containers where i've taken uh you know and bought the aquarium rock and actually put the you know the different colored aquarium rock and made some interesting shapes on top of the mulch uh, so that you get some additional color from that. Uh, and at the same time, it's just an additional mulch on top of the bark mulch. Okay. All right, I think we've got um, time for about one more question. All right, make a good one. Okay, so when potting, when you're mm -hmm. actually potting the plant, is it better to keep the root ball intact or do you want to like release some of the dirt around the roots and stuff? That's a good question, and I'm sorry I didn't bring that up earlier. You know, I always advise people when they go to a nursery to, if they find some things they like, to either ask somebody or if they're comfortable doing it, you know, turn the pot over on the side, squeeze it a little bit, pull out the plant gently, you know, so that you're able to see if it's root bound or not. If it's root bound, obviously you're gonna need to either cut, disturb, uh, loosen some of that roots or else it'll stay root bound when you replant it. But also you want to check to make sure that it wasn't just recently potted up and so it wasn't a little bitty tiny uh, plug that is in a big pot that hadn't had a chance to grow root structure yet. So just kind of look at it and see, uh, you know, sometimes it's been in the pot too long and you have to cut it or tear it apart. Uh, but if it's, you know, got a normal amount of roots, just loosen it up, just stay here. Okay, and um, some people are saying that they couldn't read on your slide the small phone number. Can you just verbally say sure. your phone number? 817-884-1945. That's the office number, that's the receptionist, and she can, uh, take a message or, or forward it or send me an email or whatever it may be. So 817-884-1945. Great. And so today, if we didn't get to any of your questions or if you have like maybe a more in-depth question or something like that, then you can call Steve and get information straight from him. Um, you can also go to saveterrantwater.com slash ask and you can submit any questions that you have there as well. There you go. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. And um, that was a lot of excellent information, tons of information. Um, I wanna thank you again, and then also the city of Mansfield that, was, that provided this free opportunity for everyone. 
Um, if you'd like to get notified of any future events like this one, you can sign up for our, our um, newsletter at safeterrantwater.com slash sign dash up, and we'll send you um, updates for all of our future events that are like this. Um, also, um, you can go check out our event calendar there at safeterrantwater.com slash events. Um, our next free online event is going to be a care and repair DIY sprinkler class on um, June 25th with the city of Crowley. And you can check out more information about that on our event calendar. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us. You're for, very welcome. Let us know if there's any other particular topic that you'd like to hear. We'll see if we can't put one together for you. Yeah, definitely. And after this, I'll send out a, um, a survey to everyone's emails that um, attended. So if you have any suggestions for future things that you'd like to hear about, definitely let us know. And thank you so much again, Steve and the city of Mansfield for um, providing your time for us. And thank you all for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye.